Hi, everyone. Welcome you all to our monthly Nature of Inference Colloquium series. And uh, um, as you all know, this is a new series that we have started at the Frankie program, motivated by um, a lot of my own work. Um, and those of you who don't know me, I'm Priya Natarajan. I am an astrophysicist, and I happen to be the current director of the Frankie program in Science and the Humanities at Yale. Uh, my own work is has been in trying to understand the phenomenology of black holes um, in the universe and a persistent issue that has nagged all the modeling and conceptual work I do is whether the correlations, empirical correlations that we actually see between properties of black holes and the galaxies that host them and so on, whether they actually reflect a causal physics or are they just happens chance, a consequence of some kind of statistical manifestation of the evolution of structure formation. So that sort of seeded this interest, but I've been so fortunate that as part of this series, uh, we have invited very distinguished researchers across disciplines who are working on understanding the complex issues of causal inference, focusing on how we draw robust conclusions from conceptual models and simulations. So uh, the series represents cutting edge researchers who are exploring various kinds of uh, conceptual frameworks, agent simulations, ab initio time evolution modeling of complex nonlinear systems, propagation of genetic transcription and expression, climate modeling, um, to distill the role that modeling actually plays in helping disentangle correlation and causation. And so we are getting this, we're gonna get this multidisciplinary view of how this is done. It's a very challenging problem. And it's a very fundamental problem in epistemology across intellectual disciplines, this distinction between causation and correlation. So uh, first, let me thank uh, uh, Mr. Um, and Mrs. Richard and Barbara Frankie for the generous support of the Frankie program and all the other activities at Ray Yale that they have supported. Um, they plan to join us uh, uh, today for our talk. And I also just want to remind you that we are recording this event. So I would uh, request you all to mute your videos. And as for questions after this afternoon's talk, uh, we would like you to submit them through the chat feature. And uh, either I, um, I or uh, Professor, um, um, we don't expect Professor I to be watching the chat. So it would be either Dr. Cam or I who would be reading out the chat questions. And our format will be as per usual after his talk, we'll have a Q&A afterwards. And um, I also want to remind you that a part of the series, we have a follow-up detailed discussion and Q&A the following day after the talk. And uh, Professor I has kindly agreed to do that tomorrow again at the same time, 3 p.m. And that will be a conversation between him and Professor Kyle Cranmer, who is a physicist who is working also on applications of machine learning and AI techniques to big data in physics. So really looking forward to that exciting conversation as well. So let me first introduce our distinguished speaker today. Uh, professor I is an honorary professor at the Max Planck Institute for Mathematics in the Sciences at Leipzig and has a joint appointment at the Santa Fe Institute. Uh, he studied mathematics and physics at Ruhr University and received his PhD from the University of Leipzig um, in 2003 and four, he was a postdoctoral fellow at the Santa Fe Institute and at the Redwood Neuroscience Institute, uh, which is at Berkeley. And after his postdoctoral time in the US, he became an assistant professor at the Mathematical Institute at Frederick Alexander Universities in Erlangen. And since September, 2005, he's been a group leader at the Max Planck Institute for Mathematics in the Sciences, uh, where he's currently heading the group on information theory of cognitive systems. As a professor of Santa Fe Institute, he's involved in research on complexity and robustness theory. And um, since December 13, he also has an honorary professor of information geometry. That's a very intriguing title at Leipzig. And he is, um, looks like he's going to actually be moving very soon uh, to the Hamburg University of Technology, where he's going to be spearheading and building up an entirely new institute, the Institute of Data Science Foundations, as part of their Technology and Innovation Center for Hamburg. So uh, Professor I today will start by providing us an introduction to the field of causal networks 
and will then focus on giving us some simple examples to drive home and highlight the core conceptual and philosophical ideas that underlie this theory. And he has a very novel approach that will show us how this kind of new language that he has developed that will allow us to distinguish between causation and correlation. And he's also going to teach us that this allows us to study how cause and effect relations will give rise to a very particular kind of correlations and they can be uh, exploited to infer causal relations in turn from the observed correlation. So you can imagine that I am particularly excited because I think it's going to be very, very relevant for uh, my own uh, uh, personal research agenda, but I'm sure that you will all be excited to hear and learn from him today. So without further ado, um, Nihat, I would like to um, invite you to start. Thank you so much for agreeing to speak in our series. Yeah, thank you very much for inviting me and giving me this opportunity. Um, let me share my screen. So thank you again. As I uh, wrote in one of my emails, my, my presentation is going to be a little bit technical, but uh, my intention is actually to highlight the core structures of uh, causal networks and uh, the uh, main um, philosophical reasoning there. And um, I want to make the point as, a, um, as an introduction, I want to make this point how far we can get actually with a mathematical formal structure of uh, uh, causation. So this is the outline of my presentation. I know I, I'm not going to uh, have enough time to go through all these uh, subjects uh, in detail, but uh, I think I will try to communicate the main, main points. So let's start with the, uh, causal, uh, with the structure of causal networks. So the main building block of a uh, causal network is uh, the notion of a mechanism. And the mechanism is um, let me. basically the idea is that you have a function. So it's a mathematical uh, object, f of x, y is f of x. And then you al uh, allow for disturbances of that function. So this is the disturbance u. Often you have a model where y equals f of x plus some disturbance. So that would be some kind of additive noise. It can be multiplicative noise. But this version of it uh, is uh, much more general. So the function itself depends on the input x and the disturbance u. So that's the most general way to write down a, um, a mechanism, a deterministic mechanism. And that actually has been um, already considered uh, in genetics and econometrics, social sciences, information theory, and so on. So the idea is that the disturbance, it's actually not ob observable. So what you observe is the X and the Y. So let me, okay. Basically you integrate out the disturbance and as outcome Y, uh, uh, you get you get a distribution of points. For e each point here is generated by by one disturbance small u. So if you integrate out this uh, the disturbance u, you get for each input x a distribution of y's. Formally, this after integrating out the disturbance, you get a mathematical object that is called Markov kernel. Sometimes you call it stochastic matrix or stochastic map. So the basic requirement here is that uh, for each X, you have a distribution on the Y's. That's all. So it means that uh, kappa of X, Y is greater than or equal to zero because that's the probability. And uh, the sum over the Y's or the integral over the Y's should be one. That's all. So that's the definition of a Markov, of a so-called Markov kernel. And that's the basic object, uh, basic mathematical object that is used in order to model a mechanism. The mechanism in the context of causal networks is given in terms of a Markov kernel or stochastic map. As I said, this has been used in many contexts and uh, with the same, you can do the same construction here in the context of uh, uh, of uh, quantum mechanics, and there you end up with the so-called completely positive map, which is uh, frequently used in quantum information theory. 
So that's the building block. Now the question is how to put together these mechanisms. The structure that describes how to uh, combine these mechanisms is a directed uh, acyclic uh, graph. So basically it's uh, uh, as shown here. So you have the nodes, these are the variables, A, B, C, U. Uh, U does not, uh, is not uh, the disturbance here, it's one variable. And uh, so basically the, the uh, semantics here is whenever you have an arrow, for example, from A to B, A is the direct cause of B. B is the effect, direct effect of A. And you also require that the cause always comes uh, um, before the effect. Okay, that was the subject of the previous presentation. So uh, the uh, the order has to be first first the cause and then the effect, and that excludes cycles like this. This is the the reason why we have to assume that um, the underlying structure is given in terms of a directed acyclic graph. So some people actually question this uh, this uh, assumption here, but it's it's crucial. So we have in the context of uh, once given such a graph, you can talk about the parents of a node V denoted by PA. So which uh, are simply those nodes uh, that point to V. Uh, then the descendants of U, these are those uh, nodes that can be reached by, uh, from U, the non-descendants and the ancestors. So basically, it's it's clear from the from the naming here what it means. So now we have the the graphical structure. In my first slide, I explained what we mean by a mechanism, and now we have to put these two structures together. So we we uh, we start with a directed acyclic graph. That's the structure, and then we we uh, assume that for each node, we have given such a Markov kernel, a, a, um, a mechanism, which basically is nothing than a, a stochastic map. So it takes the inputs, for example, in X4 here, that node takes these as inputs and generates a distribution over X4. So you have a mechanism in all, all nodes here. The only, um, a node that does not get any input is X1. So that's simply a probability distribution over X1, but all the others have mechanisms sitting uh, um, in them. So, and as I explained, um, whenever we have a directed uh, arrow here, um, we, we refer to V as being the direct cause of W and W being the uh, direct cause of V. And if I have such uh, this curly um, arrow, that means that there's a path from V to W. So that's, uh, in that case, I simply talk about cause and effect without, uh, uh, without uh, referring to, uh, to it being a direct, uh, direct cause. So this is a simple example uh, taken from Judea Pearl's uh, book. Uh, it's a quite uh, famous book here uh, where the foundations of cause networks uh, are um, developed. And uh, so I'm not going to into the details here, but uh, with these, with these, uh, um, this kind, uh, kind of Bayesian network, you can actually describe a uh, causal structure or causal interaction of, uh, of variables. So this is a more complicated, these are more complicated networks um, than uh, the previous ones, uh, which are more like toy examples. And these networks are taken from uh, also famous book uh, um, uh, by, by leading experts of, uh, of the field by Lau Lauritsen and uh, David who, uh, uh, and Spiegelhalter Lauritsen is actually one of the uh, most famous uh, people in graphical models theory. So this kind of, uh, of graphical representations of causal structures. 
Then I added actually this slide here. So I was, uh, I had long conversation with my daughter today and tried to figure out which movies to take here, which somehow uh, tried to violate this idea of uh, directed acyclic graphs. So you have time travels where you have loops between the uh, uh, past and the future. So there are people, and in these movies actually, people try to justify even such loops uh, uh, physically. Um, and this uh, this uh, this uh, movie here, Groundhog Day, was actually presented uh, by the Santa Fe Institute uh, many years ago, and it was commented by Murray Gelman, who actually uh, discovered the quarks, and uh, he he was asked whether this makes physical sense. To the idea is to go to start again a new day uh, every day uh, to start again and try to improve. So you go back uh, after after you spend the whole day, you go back to the beginning of the day and try to improve your behavior. And at the end of the day uh, of these iterations, you even become an expert in piano playing, even if you are not an expert in the beginning. So you really have these loops uh, and which allow you to, to improve here. And again, so it was actually uh, uh, stated by Gelman that uh, this is physically a reasonable um, idea. And uh, the same with the other movies. So in this last movie here, Tenet, uh, they even uh, tried to, uh, to build the whole story uh, based on the second law of thermodynamics, which was, as we have seen in the, in the last presentation, is a basic argument uh, on um, uh, explaining the direction the direction of time. Okay, let me go to the second uh, topic. So now, once we have the causal structure here, the causal network, we can define how the mechanisms uh, which are part of this network uh, generate uh, the phenomena. So how they generate actually a distribution. So basically it's a simple rule. You, you start, you have a numbering of the nodes, which, uh, which is compatible with that structure. So here the numbering is uh, you start with U, then A, then B, then C. And then you basically apply the mechanisms uh, according to this numbering. So you choose U according to the probability distribution phi of U. So it doesn't have any parents here. Then you choose A, so it is, uh, according to the distribution of A given U. So this is a Markov kernel and then you iterate, okay? So these are the mechanisms. Uh, note that I did not use the letter P here. It really in order to refer, make a distinction between a mechanism and the probability distribution. So the right-hand side is basically a combination of mechanisms and it describes how the, uh, the probability distribution uh, that uh, uh, of, the, uh, of, the, um, of joint events on the full, full set. So the distribution, the probability of U, A, B, C is exactly given in terms of these mechanisms. So, I want to highlight here that the left-hand side is basically describing the phenomenology and the right-hand side is describing the mechanisms. And this equation is giving you a rule how to generate uh, the phenomena based on the mechanism, uh, mechanisms. Now we can ask the question, once we know the, uh, the phenomena, uh, the joint distribution, can we actually infer the mechanisms based on this, uh, this phenomena? Uh, and the answer is, we can, we can try, and the, pe the way people try it is in, uh, in the following way. So they take the distribution, the joint distribution, so this is the observed distribution, and then you can actually test condition independence statements. So if this distribution is generated by mechanisms that are compatible with this graph, then it has to satisfy this condition independence, these two condition independence statements. So U is independent, stochastically independent of B given A, and C is independent of A given U and B. 
So these are the two conditional independence statements that follow from this structure here. So if you take the, the joint distribution and do these tests, you will actually, you will be able to verify this. And the question is, do we recover the underlying structure only by testing this? And the, the, the answer is no, we don't, because there are many more graphs directed acyclic graphs that satisfy the same set of condition independence statements, okay? In this case, so that's, that's this graph here, but you can also change, uh, uh, modify this graph a bit, and it will give you the same set of condition independence statements. And uh, this is actually referred to as Markov uh, um, equivalence. So all three graphs will be Markov equivalent in the sense that they will give you the same condition independent statements. So once you have generated with the mechanisms, the joint distribution, so the phenomenon, uh, once you have reached the phenomenal, uh, phenomenological uh, level, you cannot go back to the, to the mechanism simply by observing and testing the condition independence statements. So, and there is a, there is um, a whole, uh, the, the, the theory is well de developed that describes actually uh, the equivalence, Markov equivalence classes of, of graphs. So it's a well-known theory. I, I'm going to skip this and uh, continue with uh, section number three. So the intention of uh, this, uh, the Markov, my, my present, uh, presentation of Markov equivalence is to show you that just ob observing the system is not enough. So you can observe, but you will not be able to recover the, uh, the full uh, underlying structure simply by observation. So this is why Perl actually introduces the notion of intervention. So you have to be able to intervene into the system. And this is a second kind of experiment. So experimental operation, if you wish. One experimental op operation is observation. And the second one we are going to talk about now is intervention. And I'm going to define intervention. I have to refer to the previous uh, 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 presentation. Intervention was also mentioned several times. Um, especially when uh, stating that the future can be influenced through intervention, but not the past. So that was that that can actually be verified within this uh, uh, setting here. Uh, so let me define uh, intervention. So let's say uh, let's assume that this is the the causal the causal um, um, network. So we have a directed acyclic graph and we have the mechanisms alpha, beta, gamma, and we want to intervene in A and then observe B. So what does this mean? Um, so intervention in A means the following. If we, if we consider the full joint distribution according to the original mechanisms alpha, beta, and gamma, it will be given according to this formula. That's the formula that I have just uh, um, discussed. So now you could observe the conditional probability of B given A that uh, using standard uh, probability theory, but intervention means something different. Intervention means changing the mechanism. So in this product structure here, we have in A, we have the mechanism alpha. Alpha takes input from U and generates a distribution of small a's according to alpha, okay? That's the Markov kernel sitting in A. Now, if we intervene in A, let's say we want to set the, the state of A to A hat. Then that means that we decouple, basically we change the mechanism of A by replacing it uh, by alpha hat. And alpha hat is simply a spe very special Markov kernel, which is one, it gives the distribution one. Uh, so the probability of A is one if A equals A hat and zero otherwise. So this is nothing but uh, saying that uh, we set the state of A to A hat, that's it. And uh, in order to stay with my previous, for, uh, 
uh, formal description, um, um, I need to define a Markov kernel and that's the way I do it here. Formally, it simply means changing the mechanism to uh, a constant value A hat. And now instead of this product structure here, we have a new product structure. So that's the, we get a new causal uh, a, a network, but now the mechanism in A is changed to A hat. Uh, alpha hat, from alpha to alpha hat. So phi remains the same, beta remains the same, gamma remains the same, and alpha is replaced uh, for, uh, by alpha hat. And that's it. That's the post-interventional distribution. Now let's uh, consider, so what I have shown to you here is the post-interventional joint distribution after imposing A hat. Now I want to marginalize out U, B, and C, just to know the post-intervention distribution over B imposing A. So that means, so that's the thing we want to compute. So what, what do we see in B if we impose A hat? So that's basically marginalizing out all the others, U and C. Uh, so we take this post-intervention distribution that I have derived previously and marginalize out, and that has the product structure, and then we can go through the calculation, and you get P of B as the result of, of the intervention. So that means that the effect of, uh, of uh, intervening in A is simply, so if I intervene in A and set the state to A hat, I will observe B with the original probability P of B. The important thing to note here is that B, that probability distribution is not dependent on A hat. So it's different from it. This is really something that you don't get with, uh, uh, with uh, classical conditioning. So with classical conditioning, the conditional probability of B given A, so as shown here, will be actually dependent on A. But when you uh, intuitively, you, will, you would not, because there is no arrow here, you would not expect any effect in B if you intervene in A because there is no path from A to B. And this is exactly what you get here. So as a result of intervention, you get simply the distribution of B with no dependence on A hat. So this reflects our intuition that there is no path from A to B, okay? Oh, um, and, Nihat, I just had a quick question. So we are still okay. talking about deterministic systems, right? So that there isn't, when we say there's no path between from A to B, do you mean that there is a very suppressed probability for a path from A to B, or there really is no path from A to there B? There is no, no path from A to B. So that's that's the that's the assumption here. So the underlying the structure of it is a directed acyclic graph, and uh, some of the edges are simply not there. So th that means there's no causal inf no possibility. It's it's like the future mm -hmm. causally influencing the past. Right. Intuitively, you would say there is no possibility, even right. no low probability. Okay. So and, simply, and that is independent of whether the system is classical or quantum, right? So, uh, so the quantum version of this, I uh, it's is not uh, is not well developed. So I'm I'm I was referring to quantum setting in the context of a mechanism. So each of these pro, uh, factors here are uh, Markov kernels, and in the quantum setting, this would be completely positive maps. But um, the theory of causal networks is not well developed in, uh, in, um, in the quantum setting. So, but the, the notion of a mechanism is, has an analog in the quantum setting. Okay. Thank you. You are welcome. So, um, yeah, so we have the post-interventional distribution here and it really is different from the usual conditioning uh, P of B uh, given observing uh, A hat. But now let's do the same thing, now intervening in U and observing C. So we can do the same calculation here, a, a similar calculation. So P of C imposing U hat, 
And if you go through it, this time it turns out that it's the same post-interventional distribution uh, that you get if you, if you condition according to the classical conditional distribution. So that's, that's the classical version of it would be P of C comma U hat divided by P of U hat. That's the classical version of it. And we have seen here that it's not the same, but in this case, it is the same. So the do operator, the intervention operator is exactly the same in this example as the classical conditioning operator, okay? Uh, and uh, that has a reason actually. So you can sometimes, as we see sometimes, the, uh, the intervention gives you, the post-interventional distribution is the same as the, um, or, or, or interventional conditioning is the same as classical conditioning, and sometimes it's not. And let me just summarize here. So how we, how we, what we just did, or maybe I can just uh, skip this. So there's a general, general uh, formula for, for computing the post-intervention distribution, but I'll skip this. So here's, here's the answer when the intervention, interventional conditioning gives you the same as the observational conditioning. So the do means we intervene in A and observe B, and that's the distribution over the the uh, over a, uh, B imposing uh, in A, and that's the conditional distribution. And they are the same if and only if uh, there is uh, B is uh, so. So they are the same if B is not a cause of A and there is no common cause of A and B. And you can read it out structurally. So for example, if we look at A and B, so there, uh, B is not a cause of A because there's no path from B to A. So that's satisfied. And there is no common cause of A and B. So there is no uh, uh, node pointing to A and B. So if we revert this direction, then there would be a common cause here. So if this is satisfied, so this condition is satisfied, then the interventional conditioning is the same as the observation conditioning. But if we look at C and B, there is a common cause of, uh, I'm sorry, uh, C, yeah, B and C, yeah, B and C. So C is not the cause of, uh, of B, so the first, requirement is met, but there's a common cause of B and C. It's this one. So we have U, which is with a directed path from U to B and the directed path from U to C. So there's a common cause of B and C. And in that case, we cannot expect the, the intervention to be the same as uh, observation. Okay, and the same with, uh, with, this, uh, with this case. Uh, the causal effect of A on C, we have a common cause on A and C. So again, we don't have equality. So this characterizes exactly the situations where intervention differs from observation. But intervention gives us more. And now comes, uh, now, now comes a really important thing that uh, um, notion, the notion of identifiability of causal effects. So let me, let me motivate this a little bit. So we know intervention gives us more, some information, sometimes more information than just observing the system. This is what I tried to, to, uh, uh, to demonstrate here. But often, I mean, if we know all the mechanisms, I have shown you the formula for the intervention, you could simply compute the post-intervention distribution. But that's, that's, uh, that doesn't help us much because we do the intervention in order to get the mechanisms. So that's the chicken egg problem, okay? So we don't know all the mechanisms so that we can actually uh, compute the post-intervention distributions. So on the other hand, in experiments, so in experimental intervention setting, we, we take a system, a natural system, and we do intervene into the, into the system experimentally. So we don't do the computation, so what will happen, um, but we simply test it. So we do the intervention 
and observe the system and see if there is any effect. So that's the experimental intervention. But this, of course, we cannot do. Uh, I mean, sometimes there are ethical problems. You cannot intervene into the brain of a, of a person. That's simply not possible, OK? So this is like a, you know that you can get, get uh, more information out of the system if you intervened experimentally, but sometimes it's simply not possible. So the question now, and the deep question is, can we predict the outcome of intervention even without actually intervening into the system, simply by observing it. And that's, that's, that's the, the question of identifiability of causal effects. And the answer is sometimes we can. And uh, here's an example. I have two examples. So one is actually, um, yeah, I refer to it as the back door example, and the next one will be the front door example. These are typical examples which you can uh, study in Pearl's book. So if you intervene in B and observe C, so we do the same calculation that we did before. So the marginalization steps, then you have the joint distribution. In the joint distribution, you can replace by the mechanisms and then do the calculation here. And then you end up with this formula here. And the nice thing about it is the following. On the left-hand side, you have the do operation. So which, seem, which, which basically says, if you intervene in B, you will, if you did this, if you do this uh, experimentally, you will observe this distribution on C. But if you don't do it experimentally, you can simply go through this calculation and read out this, this uh, um, expression here. So this expression basic can be completely computed based on the joint distribution of A, B, and C. So this is simply P of A comma B comma C divided by P of A comma B, and this is P of A. So that's all computable by simply observing the joint distribution A, B, and C. And that's somewhat confusing, but uh, it, yeah, so it basically suggests that you can replace the actual intervention here by observation, by the information that you get in terms of, of, of observing the system, but you have to change somehow the, the formula. So it's not just P of C uh, given B in the classical setting, so that would, if you condition A here, if you write P of A given B here instead of P of A, then you will end up with uh, P of uh, C uh, given B in the classical way. But uh, this formula is, so to say, different from the classical formula. But it, this equation tells you that you can actually predict the post-interventional uh, post distribution based on observations. So in this setting, in the terminology of Pearl, we can say that the causal effect of B on C is identifiable by the joint distribution A, B, and C, okay? So we, we don't really intervene into the system. We simply observe, and then we can compute what, we, what would happen if we intervened into the system. So that's the philosophical, uh, um, uh, a th a thought here. So, for example, we can use it in, the, in, this, in this setting. So I tried to draw a large network here. So it's of course not huge, but it's uh, um, enough to demonstrate the point here. So if you have such a network and you want to intervene in V and observe W, Okay, so what, what is the causal effect of V on W? So you could, of course, if you knew all the mechanisms, you could, you could compute this, as I have demonstrated. But uh, this we don't have. So the question is, and if you just observe the joint distribution of V and W, you can compute the conditional distribution of, v, uh, of W given V. But the, the backdoor criterion tells us, so this formula tells us that we can actually compute what would happen in W if we intervened in V by just observing V, W, and in addition to that, 
the parents of V. So you see it, so the, 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 inter, uh, the, um, the causal effect of the post-interventional distribution on W imposing XV on the left-hand side, so that's an interventional concept, can be written as something which is computable based on observations only. So by observing V, W, and the parents of V, no matter what the surrounding is of the system and how huge it is, it doesn't matter. You only need the dis joint distribution of V, W, and the parents, and then you will be able to predict the outcome of intervention without intervening. So in other words, if you, if you take the brain and you, you, can, you could, if you knew the parents of each uh, of, of, uh, of a particular neuron, you could actually predict the effect of that neuron on some other region in the brain simply based on this joint distribution. So there's a question. Hi, Nihat. This is uh, Kyle Kramer. I just wanted to kind of, you know, check or clarify that the, you know, the, the, the part on the left where you actually make the intervention, of course, you could do that experimentally and then just see what happens. The part on the right is, is the result that you get, uh, but that's assuming the, the, the causal diagram, right? I just wanted to kind of, because the, 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 the language you're using kind of sounds like you could avoid doing the, the intervention and you can just compute it from the joint distribution. But yeah. I, I think, uh, but you, yeah, yeah. It, so that's it's the case for assume you're making that assumption, right? Yeah, so that's a very good point. Uh, I'm actually not, that's partly true. And it's, it's actually a very good point. So some, so you could think that in order to make this, to, to have this equation, uh, you, you, need, you need to assume, uh, so to say, to know uh, the structure of the underlying, the underlying structure of the network. The point I want to make here is that we don't need that actually. No matter how this surrounding network is, you don't need any information about this. Uh, the only information that you need, but that might be even too much, is what are the parents of V? So only knowing the joint distribution. So you, you do know, need to know the parents of V. So which is in this case, just I and J. In the setting of, uh, of neurons, of course, you have like 1,000 or 10,000 neurons uh, connected to, to, to one particular neuron. So you would have to record all the parents. But um, the brain is, of course, much more. So, you, you, uh, so the point I want to make is that local information uh, uh, related to V is enough in order to predict the outcome of intervention in V um, with respect to W, no matter what, what structure is around that, uh, um, that triple here. So that you don't need more information. You need some part of it. That's, I think, the benefit of it. So it is really a full, it's really a full chicken egg problem if you would assume to know the whole network. But the main point here is that you don't need to know the whole network, but you do need to, to know something about the network. Does that right. answer and your you question? Yeah, no, I agree. I just, and, and this conditional on the right, would you consider that local information? It seems like in the picture, you know, W and V are quite distinct, but I agree. It's certainly not knowing the whole network. It's a, you, you, it's a much smaller amount of information you need to know. Yeah, that's much smaller. So I've co of course, the, in my drawing, I wanted to highlight how small it is. So I have just two parents here, uh, uh, two nodes as parents. But uh, sometimes it is feasible. You could you could uh, record from the parents and the node itself. So the so you have to record from the parents of V. And so this is the joint distribution that you need here. And if you don't have access to that, there is no way to compute it. Okay. But it's much much less than knowing the full joint distribution. Yeah, great, thank you. You're welcome. So that's that's uh, one thing. Yeah. That's the backdoor criterion, and the front door criterion is uh, somewhat surprising, uh, more surprising. Um, if if you had this this network here, let's say. So the way I think about it is, so I have. Let's say these are like. 
intrinsic observations of a, of a system, intrinsic variables of a system, and then you have a U is a huge, the, the, the huge environment, let's say. And uh, so it's acting on A and C. So this is, this is a common cause of A and C. And it seems that there is no way to actually compute the, to, to predict the effect of intervention in A on C without having the full information here. So let's say an agent is really restricted to observing A, B, and C, and then it's affected by, by you. And the only requirement that you have here is that this intermediate variable is not affected by the environment. So just A and C. But the way it's set up here is uh, to actually demonstrate that it could be quite counterintuitive. So in this case, I wouldn't expect to be able to compute the effect of intervention in A and uh, on C based on, uh, based on just observing A, B, and C. But it turns out that if you go through the computation, it's a, it's a, here's a trick you have to, uh, you have to use uh, some condition dependent statements here, but then you end up with something. Um, so the interesting part is this. So you start with something that takes into account the mechanism of U, this huge, environment, let's say, or surrounding world, you, it, you have this mechanism that has this U, U, U everywhere. And suddenly in this last line, U cancels out and there's no U anymore. And this simply just uses condition independent statements that are compatible follow from this causal structure here. So this says that if you observe just A, B and C, let's call them intrinsic variables, you, you can predict the, the effect of, uh, of intervention in A on C without actually intervening into the system. And that's, that's to me, it's quite surprising. It's more surprising than even the, the front, uh, the, the backdoor criteria. Just as, a, um, as an uh, application, so we did apply this to, um, uh, in the robotics context. So, uh, coming back to maybe one comment here, I started with directed acyclic graphs, often, of course, like in neural networks or in, in agents interacting with, with the world, we have cycles, but uh, the way we interpret them are uh, that uh, is the, uh, by unfolding them in time. So you get this directed acyclic graph, which re represents the world and the, the, the brain of the agent interacting with the world through sensing and, uh, and acting, okay? And uh, we actually simulate this kind of, uh, uh, of uh, sensory motor loop in, in the context of uh, agents that you create uh, within the setting of uh, virtual robotics. So this is uh, um, a kind of uh, creature that we, for example, analyze. And then uh, an interesting question would be here, and that relates also to the previous talk, to, to the notion of agency. So what is, what is the, we could ask, what is the causal effect of the actions? So this basically summarizes the, the whole past uh, history to one variable age and reduces, uh, so to say, the whole sensor, uh, the whole causal diagram of the sensory motor loop to this more simpler one. So now you can ask, what is the causal effect of A on the next of the actions of the next sensory input? And when we started this, I was, uh, and, and we, we thought, okay, we have this mechanism of the world, which is even in a, in a simulation like this, it, it, you cannot deal with it. It has too many states. You don't, and that's basically what the physics engine, alpha is basically implemented in, in, uh, within the physics engine. And then you have the sensors. So there's no way to compute it by incorporating alpha and beta. But then we realize actually we don't need that. So if you study it carefully, the, the causal effect of the actions on the sensors is identifiable intrinsically by the agent by just measuring the joint distribution of its brain state C, its actuator states A, and the next sensor states. So the left-hand side is interventional in nature and the right-hand side is observational. 
And that's simply by, by the backdoor criteria. And you can actually use the front door criterion to compute the causal effect of your brain on the next sensor state. Again, we have an interventional thing here, interventional uh, uh, notion on the left-hand side and observational notion here. So we could let the robot simply uh, run and do something and it will record a joint distribution and then predict its causal effects on the next sensor input. So the, the uh, shortcoming here, and uh, uh, I want to highlight this, all these equations are based on the assumption that uh, the probability distributions are strictly positive. Pearl is assuming this and uh, identifiability of causal effects always uh, starts with this assumption. In robotic settings, we have uh, functional dependencies and this, uh, this assumption is not met. This is why we are actually working on generalizations of this kind of, uh, of um, identifiability. So that's just one, one application. Um, let me come maybe, so how much time do I have left? You could go for another uh, five to 10 minutes if you wanted to. Okay, let me highlight the common cause principle because I think this is really, really important. So we have seen that uh, observation is not enough. So we have to intervene sometimes in order to get the structure out of, of the system. And then if we cannot intervene, we can actually identify sometimes the causal effect even without actual intervention by so-called virtual intervention, replacing the, the intervention by observation. But that as uh, pointed out correctly, that requires some additional information about the underlying structure, like knowing the parents, for example. You don't have to know everything, but you have to know something. And sometimes you even don't know that. So you know, don't know anything. And this is why I got interested in the common cause principle. Even without knowing anything, you can say something about the underlying uh, causal structure. And that brings me to the, uh, to the common cause principle. So let me first uh, introduce what, how we model, uh, how we quantify stochastic dependence. So basically, I, I really like this information geometry quantification. So stochastic dependence basically compares a joint distribution of variables from the product of the marginals, okay? And you have independence if this equals this here. So if you have equality, this is a one. So this becomes one and logarithm of one is zero. So the whole thing becomes zero. So basically a stochastic dependence is the distance from independence. And by distance, I mean the kullback leibler distance or kullback leibler divergence, which is this quantity here. So, and here's a visualization. So this manifold here, this uh, surface is basically denoting the set of all distributions that have product structure. And dependence is simple, dependence of a joint distribution P in a joint distribution P is quantified as distance from independence. And this distance is referred to as multi-information. And in this case where you have two variables, so n equals two, it's simply the mutual information. So that's a nice geometric interpretation of stochastic dependence. So now I want to present a quite strong theorem that we derived, uh, but for that, I need to introduce the notion of a common cause so let's say we have a network and we have observed variables here denoted by uh, in green here, highlighted in green. So these are the observed variables and we have some surrounding uh, causal network. And AC denotes the set of elements in the network, in the full network that reach at least C observed variables. Okay, for example, A2 is this, so this is denoted by red dots here, red uh, nodes. So all the red ones reach at least two observed variables. For example, this one reaches this and this. 
Okay. This one is reached, uh, reaches also to, it reaches this observed one, but it also reaches itself by a path of length zero. That's an important point here. And we refer to this as the set of common ancestors. So that's this uh, A stands for ancestors. And the important point here is that when you observe the joint distribution, so you have N observed variables and you, you basically quantify their correlation in this way, H denotes the entropy. So you take the sum of marginal entropies and subtract C times the, jo the uh, joint entropy. So for C equals one, it's simply this, this quantity here. For C equals one, it's simply the multi-information. So that will be greater than or equal to zero anyway for C equals one. But, so the, the theorem that we could, uh, that we could actually, the uh, inequality that we could prove is the following. You can upper bound, uh, lower bound the entropy of the common ancestors of degree C plus one by this quantity here, quantity of correlation only on the, of the observed variables. So again, the right-hand side is something that can be computed based on the observed variables. The left-hand side really requires the full surrounding network and it has, it's the entropy of the common ancestors. So which means that if you observe n variables and you, quantif you, uh, you evaluate this quantity, and it, it turns out to be positive, then you can infer that there is at least one common ancestor uh, of at least C plus one observed variables. So you can infer the existence of common ancestors of observed variables, because otherwise it's not possible to explain the correlation of the observed variables. Here's an example, the famous Reichenbach uh, common cost principle. If you just plug in C equals one here, it tells you basically that's a corollary of the, this general theorem. If two observed variables are de dependent, then, uh, so these are the two variables, then there must be a path from one to two, a path from two to one, or there must be a common cause of both of them. So that's a simple implication of the more general theorem that we have. Here's another example. If you have variables that are completely correlated, maximally correlated, then you cannot explain, then there must be a common cause of all of them. So that's the implication. So this kind of correlation, complete correlation can only be achieved by a common cause or common ancestor that reaches all observed nodes. This already excludes, for example, if you compare these networks, you can say this is possible because this reaches all of them. And here it's also reached this one. This is also possible, but these two are not possible. So you could exclude potential explanations of the data simply based on the correlation structure of the nodes. And here again, by this kind of test, you, um, if you compare the sum of, uh, of the uh, Shannon entropies with the global Shannon entropy, then this doesn't tell you anything. So all three cases are possible. If this is the left-hand side is greater than the right-hand side, then only case one and two is possible. And if even the, margin, the sum of the marginal entropies is greater than two times the joint entropy, then you can say this cannot be explained by this or this has to be this one. That's, that's the, uh, uh, the, the strength of this theorem. Uh, I'm maybe one final remark. I'm not going to talk about knockouts anymore, uh, but uh, just to, uh, refer to this in a quote. So we continued studying this, this result, which I'm really proud of. So it has been published, it has been derived by my former student, Bastian Steudel, based on my previous work. And we could show in this paper that it's a sharp bound, so it cannot get better. That's, that's it, 
uh, highlighted in this paper, but in a more recent paper, we could show that in most uh, generically, so when you sample networks, so to say, according to Jeffrey's prior, then most networks will not be uh, will not allow you to infer common causes. So it's a so it is sharp in the sense that there exist situations where you where you reach this upper bound, uh, where you have equality instead of inequality. Uh, but uh, these regions where you have this are very tiny in the space of all possible uh, causal networks. So that that's the downside of it. And. Um, yeah, I think I, I, I'll stop here. And uh, if there's interest, I could maybe tomorrow I could say more about knockout interventions. But let me let me stop here due to the time constraints. Great. Um, thank you so much, um, Nihat. This was uh, very, very intriguing. I have a lot of questions myself. So I will just go ahead and start with one and share the floor with everyone else. So I think, um, I really think this, uh, the last set of ideas, the common cause principle that you showed is really, really powerful. And that is what I can see as something that I can actually apply when I'm thinking about the kinds of systems that I'm looking at. But you know, I, I wonder what happens if we have incomplete information on the maximally correlated variable. So, you know, there are X1 to Xn that are in fact maximally correlated, but we only know about say N minus one of them or N minus two of them. Then, then how do we work things out? Because that is often the case in astrophysics. So one of the, the problems we have is we don't actually know if we, when we make observations and you see two quantities that are correlated with each other, what we don't know is whether this is a mere projection of a higher dimensional correlation between larger number of variables, or it is actually just a true contained correlation only between these two variables. Yeah, so uh, that's a very good question. Uh, so this theorem does not require completeness. So it's really, so you observe so you, 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 you know it's not complete. So there is this huge world outside and you are observing n variables. So n could be n minus one. You have the joint distribution of these n minus one uh, variables and you consider the, the uh, correlation structure of the n minus one variables and you can infer common ancestors or common causes of uh, these n minus one variables, okay? So that's, uh, it, it's not required that you know, uh, the only requirement here is that you assume that your physical the system that you you the underlying the observation can be described in terms of a causal network that's the underlying uh, assumption here if it can't then uh, you can't uh, use this inequality here to infer to infer common causes I see. but uh, this also relates to to uh, uh, to another question that uh, so of course you could take if you have the marginal distribution of n variables uh, you could you could consider all marginals of of these n variables, and you could compute these quantities that we have there for the marginals, and you could try to get out more information about uh, about the underlying network in a, lar a larger network. Uh, and it's not clear to me. Uh, I think you can get out more information than just uh, considering the quantity for the n variables. Right, and similarly, if I uh, if the correlation structure, assuming, as you said, that it's valid and you can represent it by a causal network. So suppose there are in fact N variables, but that I have um, access only to a sparser subsample. Yeah, that's a very good question. Uh, so throughout my, my uh, whole presentation, I did not address the issue of, of, uh, of uh, um, uh, statistics. So that's of course a deep problem and, and a deep, deep question uh, how to, so all I did is starting with the joint distribution, assuming that we know the joint distribution. Clearly, if we don't, if you only have data like the empirical distribution generated by the mechanisms, we have first to, um, to infer 
the, the joint distribution and then apply this inequality. So um, that's, that's something that I haven't uh, worked on yet, but it's a very important problem. So basically inferring uh, common causes uh, based on empirical uh, data distributions. That would be, that would be the, the, the core problem here. And of course, associated with it, uh, um, generalization uh, uh, aspects like statistical learning theory uh, and so on. And um, then one final question, which is, um, and in in these in these causal networks, are you making the assumption that you know the mechanism already, that you no. have prior information, or it's the mechanism that you are going to infer? Right, it's the details of the mechanism that are part of the inference. I want to know where the mechanism sits in this sort of landscape. Yeah, so you basically it's a bottom. Uh, so I started the whole thing by in a kind of bottom up approach. So starting with the with the uh, with the basic components. So you have the structure, the directed acyclic graph, and in each node you start with the mechanism, which is a Markov kernel, and then the uh, the question is. The, uh, what, what are the interesting top-down problems? So you have the observations and what are the questions that you could ask? And one question that you could ask, what is the underlying structure or what is the mechanism and so on? And in order to get them, so you, I, don't, I don't assume to know them, I only assume that they exist. And then I could aim to uh, reveal them through observation or through intervention and this is definitely possible in terms of intervention. Right. So I think this is the other thing that I wanted a slight clarity on, the sort of differentiation between an observation and an intervention. Mm -hmm. um, what, I mean, is, um, so if you can use the sensory motor example that you had of that little crawling creature. Mm -hmm. So, um, how, how would you separate? I'm trying to map it on to problems in physics. So I'm trying, because you know, their observation and uh, intervention have very particular definitions and I'm trying to see if they map onto the same definitions. So the intervention would be something like, you know, you, if you perform a controlled experiment, mm -hmm. it would be a repetition, for example, right? Would, be, uh, would that be an intervention or would that be an observation? I'm a little confused about the separation between what is an observation and what's an intervention? So basically, if you refer to this agent uh, perceiving and acting in a world, so it's doing something, it's functioning, and an intervention would require actually to set, for example, if you want to quantify the, to get the causal effect of its brain yeah. on its next sensor input. By definition, it would require somebody from outside setting its brain to one state right. and then observing uh, the next sensory input. So like uh, something from outside, but that's of course a thought experiment. The right. question is that you cannot do, right. uh, but then the question is, is it possible to get the same result? So the effect uh, of the brain state on the sen next sensory input based on just observing the system without any intervention from outside. And this is the message is, yes, it is, it's possible. Ah, okay. But um, the, you have to change the formula. So it's very simple. I mean, it's very simple. The question is whether you can apply this. Maybe I can share this slide here. Yeah, so this is, this is for example, so, so that would be the somebody from outside. I see. <laughs> controlling the actions right. and then observing what the outcome on, on, on the sensors. So, and that, that would be the left-hand side, but you can forget about this. If you can measure the joint distribution of C, A and S. The, so the, by replacing this, so you can remove, uh, get rid of the external uh, intervener, so to say, mm -hmm. uh, external agent um, by just using the formula on the right-hand side. And if you want to compare this with the, with the classical uh, conditioning, you would have to, so if you just replace P of C by P of C given A, mm -hmm. P of C given A, 
then you get exactly P of S given A without the do operator, simply by uh, the, the usual formula for conditional probabilities. Right. So it's almost, almost, uh, almost the, the same, but there is one important difference here, this conditioning here. So if you remove that conditioning on A, you get exactly the post-intervention distribution, but that has, that has it's, it's not, yeah, it's not uh, clear that you can actually apply this because this requires counterfactual situations so that you actually can compute the conditional distribution um, in uh, situations where, um, so this has to be defined in other words. Yeah, I was just gonna say that needs definition, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so that, that's, that, that has to be defined. And of course, if the probability of C comma A is zero, you don't know what this is. Yeah. And then the, this equality breaks down. So that's the downside of it. So it, it is a nice uh, conceptual thought and it might be applicable in, in some settings. In our settings uh, setting, uh, we did not, we did apply it, but we did not get very far with it because of this counterfactuals here. So uh, one has to extend the identifiability problem to situations with uh, zero probability, uh, with um, uh, to situations where the distribution is not strictly positive. Okay. <clears throat> Great, so I want to invite uh, Mark Gerstein, who is a bioinformatics expert to um, ask his question. Uh, sure, uh, I had a question, I think it was on your slide on the identifiability of causal effects. I think that was where we had uh, another question. Um, and you know, this, I, I was just curious, could you just to ex get some intuition about the formula you have there, can you just explain what would happen in the kind of complicated network if say there was only one path between V and W or if there was no paths between V and W, just, you know, just to get some intuition how that formula would be affected by that. Uh... So, so if you just as one example, because all arrows go from V to W here, right? So there's no path from W to V. Oh, no, 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 I'm saying, so, 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 so there's many paths now, I, I think mm -hmm. this is related to the question you got earlier. So there's many paths now that you can kind of track, they're indirect from V to W, right? You can mm -hmm. just track the arrows. Yeah. What if there was no pass? You could you could not follow the directed and there was no pass, or mm -hmm. there was just one single path. What what would that yeah. do to your your uh, how would how would that manifest itself in your equation? So if there is uh, no path, then the outcome of this will be simply p of x w without any conditioning here because if there is no path, then the outcome of W will not depend on any intervention here because there's no path. So no matter what kind of W uh, of state uh, you have in, uh, in V, this will not have any influence on W. Okay, sure. So that will be P of X V and that's, that's, something, that's something reasonable. If there is one path, uh, I, uh, there will be no no difference, no special uh, change of this formula, and it will not it will not uh, uh, it will not uh, simplify. Maybe maybe it's easier to it's it, it will be easier to prove this e equality here if you had only one path. If you write it down with one path, you will be able to prove this equality maybe uh, more easily. Oh, oh, okay, okay. Great, um, thanks. Um, I think there is another question now from Agastya Rana. And uh, his question is, could you provide some intuition as to why the identifiability of causal effects here only depends on the parents of V and not on all of the ancestors? Yes, that's an excellent question yeah, that I was also curious about. Um, it, the, the, the thing, the, um, the, the reason for that is that you have a condition independent statement. So the, um, the, uh, 
basically uh, in any in any um, directed acyclic graph so in any bayesian network the um, a node is independent of its non-descendants in particular independent of its ancestors given its direct uh, causes which are the parents so you have always for each node, each node is independent of its non-descendants given its direct causes. And uh, that's, that's the so-called local uh, Markov uh, property, which basically means if you know your, your parents, the state of your parents, you don't need to know more. Right. Any additional information about your ancestors or even non-descendants will not help you to, to, to predict any, uh, uh, will not improve your predictions. Right, so you're just, it's sufficient to go just one layer deep. In exactly, terms. exactly. Okay. That will be the, um, the main reason for that. So um, I guess um, I'll wait to see if there are any other questions. Meanwhile, um, I have one. So I was um, curious about, <clears throat> What about the structure of a causal network predicates predictability? Right, you can predict like outcomes of uh, say time, if I'm looking at a system and I want to understand the time evolution. And if I um, assume that I can actually model it as a causal network and that it satisfies all these conditions that we've been talking about, then is it maximally predictable? Can you then make predictions? How does predictability of future states of the system, assuming you can figure out the mechanism and so on, right? So is that connected to? No, uh, not really. I mean, there is, so the thing is that um, the causal network is really coupled with conditional independence. So the structure is, is uh, so there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between the structure, the graph, and condition independent statements. Uh, and in the context of, of a dynamical system, for example, you can, if you represent it in this way, uh, you can say the, uh, the future is conditionally independent of the past given the present, okay? This is something that you can say. Condition uh, predictability is, I think, more about, dependence as opposed to independence. So being independent or conditionally independent does not mean that the mutual information uh, uh, is high. So the mutual information between the past, let's stick with this example, the past and the future mm -hmm. uh, can be, uh, can, so the, the, the amount of information that you can extract from the past in order to predict the future can be low, even though, uh, um, uh, so that's an additional requirement. Uh, so it's independent of uh, the assumption that the past and the future are conditionally independent given okay. the present. Okay. So you can keep this, this condition independent statements, past and future uh, being conditionally independent given the present and tune the predictability up by increasing the mutual information and tune it down. No, wait, For example, wait. in an IID setting, you do have conditional independence, but there is no predictability at all. So the mutual information is zero. Right. Yeah. So that you can, so that it is tuned by the amount of mutual um, information. The exactly, exactly, yeah. exactly. That will depend, of course, on the on the mechanisms. Right. Yeah. Great. Um, let me just quickly check if uh, there are any more questions. Um, doesn't look like there are any uh, typed into the chat. <clears throat> so I want to take this uh, opportunity to remind everyone that we'll have a more detailed conversation and discussion of the concepts that were discussed in today's talk um, uh, tomorrow at the same time at 3 p.m. And the conversation will be where, between Nihat and uh, Kyle Cranmer. And we are really looking forward to it. And Nihat, thank you so much for your uh, talk this evening and look forward to seeing you tomorrow. Yeah, thank you very much. sorry about the time difference. So it's kind of a late um, um, <clears throat> um, late time for you uh, in Germany. That's, but, that's, that's, so, that's okay, thank you very much. Okay, thank you, bye-bye. Yeah. See you tomorrow.
Yeah, um, see you all tomorrow. Bye, everyone. Thank you, and bye. see you tomorrow.